Hello, my name is Andrew Hart. I'm the CEO of SPD Automotive and welcome to the eighth episode in our case series. Today we're going to be looking at the user experience of many of the technologies that have been making their way into the car. And we're joined on the line by Mark Hogan and Adam Jefferson, who both uh, head up our UX testing within SPD. Hi, Andy. Excellent. So today we're going to be covering some of the highlights and the lowlights of the roughly 30 vehicles that they've been testing over the last few years. Um, we're going to go deeper into areas like navigation, VPAs, displays. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the disruptors, both in terms of the technologies that are out there, um, but also some of the companies themselves that are disrupting the infotainment space. But let's kick off with some of the highlights and lowlights. So, Adam, Mark, you've tested around 30 cars in the last few years. Um, tell us what you've seen as being some of the best systems out there and what's made them so good. Well, certainly in the last year, we've seen some really interesting new systems. Um, two highest scoring ones so far. Um, we've got one more car to go for the 2020 series. Um, were the Land Rover Defender and the Polestar 2. Um, the Defender's got PV Pro, a completely new user interface. Um, what's interesting with that is it's built on a very consumer electronics sort of look and feel. Um, so it feels very modern. It's very much the sort of smartphone interface you expect, even though it's a landscape screen. Um, so it's very easy to use. It's a really nice interface to use. Um, and that, that was part of the reason it scored so highly. Polestar 2 is um, based on Android Automotive. So, as you'd expect, it's got Google Maps and Play Store integrated, as well as partly a Polestar interface as well. Um, the ID3 is VW's first um, car of their new generation, so to speak. Um, actually, it was a bit of a disappointment. Um, it, the, the interface in it appears, you've, you've got a very small instrument cluster, which straight away screams low technology compared to something like the Honda E, which has a massive row of screens, you've got five screens all the way across the dashboard. And although that might not reflect the system itself, it, it gives you an initial impression of what, what you can expect. Um, and in the ID3, um, the tiny cluster's got very limited functionality. And even though it has a head-up display, it's echoed in that. So actually, that was one of the disappointments in the last year. Mark, I don't know if you've got anything to add to those. So for me, um, in terms of uh, what's really sort of satisfying and pretty much a disruptive user experience, the Tesla Model 3 still stands out to me as being um, pretty notable and, and uh, still in some ways or another quite unrivaled really. And um, that's because of the, the whole concept. So forget all of the tinsely distractions, like how many screens have I got? How many monitors, you know, how, how am I using uh, cameras for mirrors or anything that's pretty superficial and ineffectual like that. Um, just going to the sort of concept of, of what it delivers to you really is this whole um, this whole platter of your features all in one place, all accessible from the one main screen. Um, and really nobody else has really tried to replicate that in, in any sort of um, direct sense. We've seen some that have imitated certain elements of that to an extent. Um, certainly some of the fledgling China OEMs where you know they, they've come from nothing and they want to really um <laughs> they don't really have a, a legacy experience to bring with them. So they're just sort of picking and choosing some of the things that they, they've discovered along the way and made their own interpretation of it. So yeah, the um that Tesla UI for me is still um, quite a unique offering. It's certainly not perfect. You know, you're really putting all of your eggs in one basket there by um, using just the one display in the middle. Yeah. But um, um, it, it's it's really quite a unique thing, and it, it's um, <laughs> to uh, use a bit of a pun, it's a bit untouchable, really, um, in, in terms of what it offers. Uh, another one that still stand out for me, um, having used it initially. Uh, 2019, the middle of that year, and actually quite recently, again, um, a few weeks ago, is the, the BMW offering uh, using their operating system seven. Um, one of the, the various iterations of it is Live Cockpit Pro. Um, that really stands out to me as a, a bit of a benchmark in terms of what you can get. Um, it's still one that's probably 
more suited to the, the uh, more adept users. So um, technophobes uh, look elsewhere, really, and that's due to its complexity. Um, and you know, it's got a sheer number of features, really. It's got quite a lot going on there. But if you've got the patience to persevere with it, it's a really rewarding experience. And mm. um, unlike some of the others, it doesn't seem to slow down when you become accustomed to it, when you learn where everything is and you start to use it quicker and quicker. Um, yeah. It seems to keep up with the user. So yeah, those are the two for me that really stand strong in the user experience department. It's interesting that Tesla's still up there for you. I mean, I remember all those years ago when we first started doing consumer testing at the Tesla. Um, th there was certainly that kind of wow factor around getting into a car with a massive display in it. And that that was very attractive. And it feels like a lot of OEMs have picked on that wow factor and tried to kind of grow their own display sizes accordingly. Um, but it's interesting that you say that what sits behind that huge display is still relatively unique within the industry. Um, and I think a lot of it comes back to that kind of simplicity that, that you mentioned, um, of being able to get all to, your, to, to all of your functions in a small number of clicks. Contrasting that with what you said about BMW, um, which feels more like for the, the kind of um, the professional users, if you like, um, who are well accustomed to it. How do you think OEM should balance that um, that need to kind of support first timers who will never have used a system before versus kind of long term timers um, who own the car or have owned the car for two or three years uh, and have become kind of more accustomed to using certain functions? Is that a trade off that OEMs need to make? Yeah, certainly is, Andy. Yeah, it's um, everything that they need to choose really is a compromise. Unfortunately, there isn't one size fits all. Um, for the likes of BMW, it's probably a bit easier to um, to carve out their demographic and really provide what they know that their users want. Um, the newcomers is a bit more difficult, really, because they don't have those uh, that, that legacy customer base to know exactly what to bring to the table for them. Um, unfortunately, you can you know you can either simplify down and not offer features and then it's really simple and really quick to learn um but then people might get bored of it quickly or they might not find that it does the jobs that they want it to and you know it doesn't really solve their everyday pain points um it's a good point that you made actually about the bmw system being traditionally more complex it's something they seem to have pared back a little in the most recent one that being said relatively speaking it is still quite a, a, a fully featured offering um, but we can see the improvements that they're making so they're sort of trying to shake off some of those um, preconceptions that some users might have uh, as a reason to turn away yeah. so there is always a trade-off and it's a really tricky one to 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 really set you know to, to draw a line in the sand of of where you want to balance the complexity with the usability um, Often, in a very, very simple and broad sense, you can kind of uh, approximate it into that kind of, you know, those two ends of the scale. Um, but there is a lot more going on behind the scenes there, you know, in terms of how you package those features, yeah. um, how intuitively you can transition from one to the other. So, um, yeah, it, it, to simplify that, there is a, a very simple way of looking at it, a simple trade-off. Um, but there's a very complex sort of pattern going on in the background, uh, a really difficult tapestry that you've got to weave to get things to get to all come together in a really coherent way. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I always find BMW a very interesting one because their heritage is much more engineering focused. Their vehicles are made by engineers for engineers to many extent, uh, and that kind of spilled over to their kind of early infotainment systems. But looking at some of their kind of latest announcements at CES and kind of last year. It does feel like they are trying to have a change in philosophy um, and they've introduced certain concepts like invisible technology you know, trying to make sure that it isn't right in your face that it kind of melds into to the rest of the car um, they've also kind of introduced what feels like a friendlier type of um, personality behind their cars um, not just when it comes to advertising their cars but even within the entertainment system they're right on, on on its own you know they, they will now say happy new year to you as cars um, Adam, what, what have you seen from BMW and what do you expect them to kind of be, be doing moving forward? 
Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point about the friendly phase, particularly from German OEMs, <coughs> excuse me, who have traditionally been a lot more state in their approach. Um, mm. There was the CES advertisement, which you probably saw, um, with the, based on the sort of cars film with the cars in the museum um, having a conversation with each other that felt yeah. like a real departure from BM, BMW's standard approach. Um, maybe this has come from Tesla, um, the sort of more comedic approach to cars, the less formal approach, and mm. perhaps the separation we're going to see when cars eventually become autonomous, that you won't be communicating with the car anymore, you'll be communicating with a system within the car. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's stick with VPAs then. Um, Mark, can you talk us through some of the kind of high-level um, strategic choices that car companies need to make when it comes to virtual personal assistance and um, and how that affects the user experience. Yeah, again, it's a very complicated story, one that you could probably think at first glance it really doesn't need to be. You know, why why is it so complicated if um, the likes of Google can, and even Apple really can start up their own offering, put, package it into a phone, and it's at everyone's fingertips? You know, why is it so hard for a car? Um, so at the moment, um, it seems a lot of the OEMs out there, they'll start with uh, a white label solution from a from a provider, be it um, a Houndify one or a Serence one, um, and then try and integrate that to meet their own needs and to integrate with their own systems in the car. Um, and to further complicate the mix, you've got um, integrations reaching out into the likes of Alexa as well as like a parallel offering. Um, so you've got this in-car system um, trying to take care of all of your in-car features. And if that's been implemented really well, you'll be able to do things like control the temperature where you know it requires a lot of communication and interfacing with the car systems or do some wacky things that aren't perhaps entirely uh, understood well, but do things like open the windows or uh, open the tailgate. Um, and then for generally your IoT things, all of those kind of use cases, you'll look to the, the likes of the Alexa integrations um, to handle all of those. So you can imagine um, really trying to put yourself in the customer's shoes, the user, um, they're driving along in the car and they have to um, still at the moment think about what they want to say to the car. You know, it's not like a free flowing dialogue between you or I. Everything is to, to an extent of flexibility. It's still fairly scripted. So you need to think, okay, I want to, uh, right, I want to change the radio station. How do I do that again? And then you have to remember, uh, how do I activate it? Do I push a button? Do I use a wake word? You know, is it like talking to Alexa at home? And if you're becoming uh, fully yeah, automated in this in this process eventually when you build up a bit of practice you could still find yourself potentially mixing up your Alexas with your hey BMWs um, and still not getting the job done that you wanted to in the end. Um, the interesting sort of hybrid crossover that we've experienced recently is the Google system in Polestar where it really does seem to be a bit of a blend of both the the phone uh, voice interface and the car one, but neither the uh, the fully fledged versions of either at, at the same time, if that makes sense. So you've got compromise going on and you're missing out on features that you might find on your phone or you're missing out on use cases that you might expect to do in the car. Um, so at the moment, it's still very much sort of a, in the progress of um, what you call like, you know, farming out to the users for the testing and, and sort of um, putting the onus on the users to really um, feedback to the OEMs on what they're happy and not happy about. Um, it's yeah, it's still it's still a bit of a bit of a messy one, I would say, in terms of like you know between what it is and a, and a clean, polished product. Um, yeah. That being said, they they can do some fairly good things. Um, you can do uh, some it, certainly in some of the most recent systems you can do some complex search queries so you can say things like okay um, I'm looking for an Italian restaurant I want one that's rated five stars and I want one with free parking as well so doing things like that you can imagine you're driving around it's late at night particularly if you're in an unfamiliar area you're tired you're hangry you know hungry and angry 
um, you, you really want the car to sort you out there. And for that yeah. kind of pain point, that's, that's where, for me, it really brings the value. And those are the kind of complex questions that you hope the system can do. And they're beginning yeah. to be able to do that now. Yeah, yeah, I guess they're getting to the stage now where it's more about educating customers um, about what they can do and how to do it. And I still struggle a lot with with my car where if you click the voice recognition button once, then you get one, but you get the in-car voice recognition. If you double click it, then you get um, Siri. Um, there's also an off-board voice recognition somewhere. It does feel very kind of split personality um, uh, and quite a challenge, I can imagine, to kind of knit together that that experience correctly in, in the back. Adam, I'm going to put you on the spot. If you were going to set up Adam Motors tomorrow um, and launch a new car company, probably with a SPAC, because that seems to be what everyone's doing nowadays, what would you do when it comes to, um, when it comes to virtual personal assistance? What, would you go for the in-house? Would you go for Alexa? Or would, what, how, how would you do it? Uh, I'd go for all of them. <laughs> no, the way, the way things seem to be going is towards um, multiple VPAs. So yeah. you have one front-end VPA, that can then um, push off questions to secondary or, or tertiary ones, um, depending on what, what the question is. So, you know, if I want to turn on the HVAC in the car, that can be handled by the primary um, BPA. But then if I want to do something else, like maybe, you know, find out what's on TV tonight or something, I might need Alexa or Google to be able to do that for me. Um, so suddenly you've got a lot more choice from all of these different BPAs. So I think but for Adam Motors, that would certainly be the way to go. Yeah. Um, there's also multimodal, um, which is really interesting. Um, we're going to be seeing a bit of that in the Mercedes S-Class. So that's integrating um, uh, the movement of the driver, um, tracking their face and their eyes. So, for example, you can look at the central display, and if something pops up on it, um, like you know, a, a better route to become available, you can just look at it and it'll say, do you want to change? And you can just say yes. And because it can tell that you're looking at the central display, it'll change that straight away. So it's much more natural interaction. That's really interesting. That, that kind of context, I can imagine, is pretty unique um, and not something necessarily that's easy to replicate with off-the-shelf um, virtual personal assistants that you might kind of bring into the car. Um, I, I, you touched on navigation there. I'd like to kind of loop back to that. Um, you know, when we first started doing user experience testing 10 years ago um, of infotainment system, that was always um, one of the big challenges that vehicle manufacturers faced. We were seeing back then the emergence of a lot of kind of very user-friendly solutions on, the, on smartphones um, through Google Maps and, and other solutions. Um, and car companies traditionally struggle with onboard navigation to match that type of experience. So you couldn't necessarily search for destinations with one line. You sometimes even had to kind of, um, you, you couldn't put a full postcode entry, I remember, with some of the early systems. Um, one, one shot input is finally becoming the norm, um, yeah. but it's, it's taken a lot longer to happen than expected. Um, yeah. But there are still surprising issues. For example, a lot of the German OEMs still haven't recognized the UK address format which is backwards from the German format. So you have to start off with the postcode, then work backwards up to the top of the address, rather than go from the first line of the address in the UK format. And that can yeah. cause a lot of problems because that's just how you naturally input the address. Mm. So it's, yeah. it's developing slowly in some ways, but then things like EVs with charging functionality um, on cars like the Polestar, um, the Polestar 2, um, that's got very good integration in Google Maps for charging, so it'll tell you the types of the charger, um, yeah. rate, how many spaces are available. So in, in that way, it's certainly moving on. Yeah, but it sounds like it's not, it's not perfect yet. It's not um, mm. completely seamless. No, it's not. Mm. Mark, I don't think you've got anything to add to that. Yeah, the, the address thing can be a bit of a pain. Um, it seems like it's certainly, as I mentioned earlier, had a quick go in the uh, the most recent version of the BMW system. Um, it still interestingly displays that on the screen, but you no longer have to um, input it that way. You can say it quite free form how you like, and yeah. um, it'll have no issues finding that. So, yeah, it seems like um, it's interesting. There's a lot of legacy styles and um, methods 
that are still hanging around in the background but it seems like they're being a bit more flexible in their approach now um yeah. and yeah. you know things are becoming a little bit more free form they, they haven't become totally open i think that's mm. the biggest difference actually at the moment between what we would kind of expect from systems as as all users really and what we yeah. still find available is that things are still um they're flexible but they have a, an element of rigidity to it they have a process behind them that's still yeah. um still very much you know feels like it's programmed and that's what for me makes it feel like you're still interacting with a machine rather than the person um unlike you know if it were completely open and free form <clears throat> yeah um where you could approach it how you would talk into another person um you can you know have essentially two um, conversations going on at the same time, flipping between the two. And you can, you know, as a person, you can sort of keep up with that. Um, yeah. We're seeing elements where you can switch the, the, the dialogue with a, with a car or a voice interface. Yeah. Um, but it's still quite one dimensional, you know, from A to B. And you're sort of restarting the conversation anywhere in between there. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's, added flexibility but still a bit of process and a bit of rigidity sort of limiting the abilities yeah. at the moment and i guess one of the kind of keywords that the industry has been working towards is that idea of an intelligent system um and you touched on it a little bit with the s class around um being able to detect what you're looking at and therefore add more context but there's other kind of aspects around intelligence about anticipating user needs about even recognizing the user uh, and their typical driving habits you know where they're likely to be going next that doesn't feel like it's made it as far into the cars as I would have expected by now. What do you think is kind of holding that back? I think um, there's a naturally a bit of apprehension as to um, how much or what types of data are being recorded, yeah. absorbed and, and shared, um, mm. particularly with uh, the, the 2018 uh, introduction of GDPR. Um, I think that was just a bit of a big scare word for a lot of OEMs and it all of a sudden made them have to really consider what they were recording if they had a legitimate reason to do so. Yeah. Um, and also handling the um, the consent practice for users. You know, how mm. can you really do that easily and effectively that's not intruding into their ability to just want to get on and use the system? You know, yeah. um, nobody wants to read through a massive long license agreement like when you've just you know, purchase a new bit of software or something like that. Um, yeah. If you know, you've just spent tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds on the car and you want to get on and use it and make your way home as well as make the most of the features that it has. So that's another tricky challenge too. How can you, again, solve some pain points, bring some useful um, help along to the user to, you know, smooth out the, the creases in, in any processes and, um, do a little bit on on behalf of them, knowing what they've done before. Um, yeah. But how do you do that in a way that doesn't intrude and doesn't put them off from using those services? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Privacy. The industry's always been kind of very nervous, but you're right. Things have changed. That the the dialogue has changed significantly over the last few years. Um, so it's yeah. kind of in that will start to slow down some of the ambitions around a super intelligent user experience that that anticipates your needs. Well, I'm not sure the technology is even there yet. Um, yeah. Google um, tells tells me things that I might want to do, and probably half the time it gets it wrong. Yeah, so yeah. that's probably one of the most advanced systems at the moment. So if that can't do it, I would imagine a lot of in-car systems just haven't reached that stage yet where they can give you useful, trustworthy recommendations that don't just become annoying or creepy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That would be the worst combination, wouldn't it? Annoying and creepy. Um, <laughs> Not only does it get it wrong, but it gets it weirdly wrong. Um, I, I can totally imagine that. I want to, before we start um, talking about disruptors, I want to talk about display technologies because that was quite a big um, topic at the last CES. We saw Mercedes with their kind of hyper display, you know, the end to end view. Um, BMW had their curved display. On the consumer electronics side, there was a lot around rollable displays. We've seen just about every form factor imaginable now. Um, do you guys think that that's a um, a big part of the user experience, or is it just kind of a cherry on the top? Is it is it more about the kind of the wow and the dazzle, um, or does it significantly change how people experience their systems? In in terms of the initial perception of the car, 
I think it makes a huge difference, but that probably only lasts for a short time. And then once you're actually using it, um, I think the Defender demonstrated very well that even though you can have a relatively small display, um, in the Defender it's a 10 inch display, as long as the content is perfectly optimized for that screen, you can still yeah. get away with that um, and give the user a really compelling experience. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Mark, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, it's really interesting that you brought up the, the recent uh, evolutions in development, Andy. Um, for me, I think those are um, expressions, you know, in a physical form from the OEMs as their, um, their new abilities to innovate. Um, so I think, you know, the underlying technology has, has really just opened the door for them to do these things. Um, yeah. I think that's the only reason why we're seeing them. So I think that they need to have a constant perception of innovation to be at yeah. the front of their field. And I think this is just the, the most recent manifestation of that. I don't think there's really much of a problem that they're solving. Um, I can't see any real clear, um, you know, like outright benefit really to these other than that it's a, a bit of a, a magpie style distraction at the moment. It's like, ah, oh, that's a really nice shiny thing. And it might get a few people through the doors into the showrooms again. Yeah. But beyond that as like a lasting, um, potential solution to a problem um i can't really see it ticking any boxes there um i think uh, if we look back probably probably started about five years ago or so now there was a bit of an arms race beginning yeah. to start in display sizes where yeah. you know things are really sort of starting to push the envelope i think probably again a bit like you mentioned earlier kicked off by the tesla solution um that opened the eyes of some of the oems i thought oh well, we better do that, otherwise we're going to look really out of date all of a sudden. Um, yeah. And that sort of died down when they settled around a common size, uh, well, relatively like, you know, a, a bit of band between them. Um, at the moment, I think it's it's settled around with the median around about 10 inches and you've got some that are a little bit bigger in the 12s and then some a little bit below in the sort of more budget systems. But around the middle, there, it seems like the most common sizes now in the new solutions are around about the 10 sort of size. Um, mm. I think they've sort of realized that just putting a massive screen in the car really doesn't fix anything. Um, yeah. I think this is the beginning of the new new phase of the the, um, the the interesting point, the talking point in the cars. Um, you know, I've got this crazy wrap around display going from corner to corner in the, across the dashboard. Look at this, you know, a bit of a party piece to show off in front of friends and family. Yeah. Um, I can't really see much longevity in that. I think it'll be around for like a generation of cars. Um, and then the, by that time, at least hoping for the for the sake of the OEMs that there'll be a new um, innovation piece to to roll out at that time, something else to um, to keep up with the arms race. So yeah, that's, that's sort of my thoughts at the moment. In the last year, we've seen um, several passenger displays in the leading ideal one, the Taycan and also the Honda E. But I think really we still have yet to see many tangible benefits from those. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like um, a, a big display without a good user experience in the back end could, could cause more problems than sort of like you said. You know, we've seen uh, startups like the Brighton display that, that is kind of quite far back. Um, and how you control that display, you know, it, the further back you push it so that it doesn't create a distraction, the harder it is to reach, which means you need other types of a uh, user experience, um, how you manage that kind of multimodal user experience design um, uh, to be able to make the most of that display, I guess it creates a huge amount of, of additional complexity. And, and if you're not careful, it will just lead to a good wow up front, followed by a very quick, oh, wow, <laughs> disappointment afterwards. Um, yeah, I do, wonder, I do wonder how putting a screen in the steering wheel is going to work. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to see how that <laughs> works. Um, yeah, it's, um, it, it, it is certainly an interesting time. I'd like to kind of cover any other disruptors that you see. So we've talked about displays. What else in terms of technology do you see coming out in the next three to five years that you think can have a significant effect on, uh, on the user experience? I think gaming engines is a big one. Um, yeah. We're seeing a lot of companies um, bringing, bringing in um, displays with Unreal Engine, that sort of thing. 
um, and you're beginning to get really complex 3D graphics and rather than just pre-recorded animations, you've got live animations on screen, um, which certainly adds to the, the feel of the system and it makes it look, look a lot more impressive and give it that wow factor. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything on gaming engines. Yeah, well, sort of to follow along in that kind of train of thought, um, I think it something that that should enable, you know, these more advanced uh, development tools, the likes of Unreal Engine and Unity, are both um, emerging as viable solutions for automotive. Um, my thought with those is that it's a really interesting um, possibility in terms of an enabler. So I think they could be a really good enabler to do do more with less. And by mm -hmm. that, I mean you can do things visually that are a lot more intuitive to users um, to give them you know, a real true to life explanation of what they're experiencing um, visually rather than text-based. So at the moment, still a lot of problem with usability while driving is imagine you have some kind of warning message pop up in your instrument cluster and it's like three lines of text telling you, oh, by the way, your tire pressure is a little bit low. Maybe check it at the next time you start your engine. Yeah, if you had something that long to read while you were driving, you'd probably have a crash. So yeah. trying to get rid of as many words as possible is, um, in theory at least, always a good thing. But then you, you risk crossing the line into um, confusing iconography where you know the, the the little telltale lamp that's just lit up you spend more time studying it trying to work out what that means as well that you <laughs> it takes even longer than reading a message yeah. so i think that with um the likes of unity and unreal where you can do some really interesting visual effects with it and um in a way that's um really quite sophisticated you know not just like some animated uh image something that's you know done in real time and can respond to the conditions accurately um, mm. you can hopefully solve that issue there of understanding what's going on, but not having to read a book on it. Yeah. Um, of course, the only um, potential hurdle to that at the moment is the kind of hardware that cars are equipped with at the moment probably aren't really suited to that at all. Um, yeah. Some of them are like uh, very similar to smartphone chipsets. Mm. So um, they can manage a few things, but really it's not like you, you need to be getting closer to really like a, what you put in a laptop rather than a smartphone um yeah. that's that's what you really need to to handle something capably um and it, you know if you don't if you did stick with the the smartphone style uh hardware um you're going to come up against things like uh really choppy frame rates where it's hitching so it's you know stopping and starting it's going to look really unsophisticated then you know you wanted to wow the users you wanted to give them something that's a really immersive experience and it's stopping and starting jittering and jolting all over the place and it just makes it you know even worse than if you hadn't bothered i think so yeah. um you know you need something that's really capable of running at least at the bare minimum a, a steady uninterrupted 30 frames per second anything higher than that you know if you can hit 60 that's again giving you a much better perception of quality there of a really capable product um 60 is probably where i'd limit it you know anything higher than that you won't be looking at the display long enough to notice the difference mm -hmm. um but yeah it, it can't be um it can't be stuttery and jolty that's just uh, a recipe for disaster people are gonna it's not just you know in terms of what you're seeing if you're interacting with a menu element it's yeah. got a really low frame rate it's going to be unresponsive it's going to feel clunky it's going to be waiting for it to load something up you know it's going to be a nightmare to use yeah yeah um i'm conscious of time but just the last one we've talked about disruptors i want to talk about the opposite of disruptors features and functions that you've seen in the car that if you were working at adam motors um what one feature or function relating to input or output um user experience would you would you get rid of because it doesn't add enough value or potentially even um creates more issues than it than it's worth it um for adam motors we've actually just taken the decision to get rid of gesture control gesture um, control. yeah <laughs> uh, a few examples from the industry vw has had very primitive gesture for a number of years um it's literally a left right swipe that does very little 
BMW's system is much more advanced, but it's still often very difficult to use. Um, it needs users to learn lots of actions, and it has questionable accuracy as well. Um, it's going to be in the new S class, um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that's implemented. But so mm. far, in anything near a perfect implementation of it. Okay, that's really interesting. Mark, do you agree yeah. with the founder of Adam Motors? <laughs> Yeah, I, I do actually. I'm definitely inclined to agree. So I think um, Adam, CEO of Adam Motors Limited, <laughs> really hit the nail on the head there, saying how you've got to know the gesture to do a certain operation. I think that's the biggest hurdle in the way of um, any sort of successful adoption of gesture at the minute is the action that I'm meant to do to do that thing. How does it link to that? You know. And you do have some successful cases of it, like the twirling finger around in a circle to do the volume control in BMW. And I think mm. that's just about the only one that really marries up to an intuitive action. Um, yeah. For me, yeah. in terms of things like what would I um, like to see the end of, um, I think it would be any kind of process in the car. And, and sorry for it sounding very general, but any kind of process that forces a user down a specific path um particularly if that path is for a use case that doesn't apply to all users so um could be mandatory sign-ins to like create an account um or even like a user profile if i've bought this car just for me for myself i don't want to set up a whole user profile around it i won't be sharing it with anyone so i don't want to waste 10 minutes doing that um but a similar sort of philosophy applied across the whole of the um, the in-car, you know, infotainment systems and things like that. which of the processes are um, genuinely necessary um, and why are they necessary? You know, have a bit of a re review there um, and which ones can be optional and can be um, maybe introduced to the user gently, but um, it's at their discretion if they want to, to make the most of that or not. Um, I think that's the main thing for me is, is choice. Again, not too much choice because that could be just confounding and baffling for users by providing them the choice of everything in the world. Um, yeah. But just the right amount of freedom to, you know, be enabled by choice. Mm, that sounds like a really good kind of best practice for, for car companies and suppliers to kind of adopt within within their entertainment strategies. Yeah. Adam, I think, what? Um, oh, if I could just quickly add on there, Andy, I think. Um, it seems like um, a lot of features that we're seeing uh, introduced recently are kind of like um, uh, a feature by committee type approach where, yeah. you know, the business decides that it must do this this thing, you know, this feature, um, but they haven't really put themselves in the user's shoes. You know, the actual people who are, who are going to be using it day in, day out. They haven't really thought about it from that perspective in some cases, um, whether that's because they don't have enough UAT going on um, or actually face-to-face -face with actual consumers, um, I couldn't say for sure. Um, but, you know, if they're not doing that, then why not? Um, they really should be um, communicating a lot more to their actual users of their cars, their actual customers, um, finding out what their pain points are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we've we've been involved in so many kind of um, prototype testing projects with different OEMs, and they tend to happen um, at a stage in their development cycles when it's almost too changed, too late to make major changes to their UX. Um, they've made certain key decisions um, and they're looking to kind of tweak around the edges and use the consumer testing as a form of validation really of what they've decided on. Um, but it, it almost needs a much more agile kind of approach to continually communicating with customers rather than doing it kind of every year and hoping that you're still kind of on track to, to deliver a competitive experience. Yeah, could not agree more, Andy. That's exactly um, very representative of the, the kinds of things that we've been involved with, the kind of conversations that we've had. And like you say, the um, the initial idea of the project to do something like the UAT or, or the, the final uh, UX sign-off, um, and it was like you say, just to sort of check that there weren't any minor things that slipped the net, and really there could have been um, one or two or even more really fundamental um, issues that are going to be uh, an everyday um, interference to to the user experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a good example of that has been 
the shift towards bigger displays and fewer buttons and finding that right balance of what do you keep in terms of physical buttons that help people kind of feel like certain functions can be quickly undertaken and what do you shift into more of a digital experience um, and if you you can almost tell which OEMs rushed to market um, and got that balance wrong um, yeah with the ones that didn't do enough work with their customers um, with a target audience to kind of really get that balance right I think HVAC's a very good example of that um, yeah the, the jury is still out really when it comes to integrating HVAC into the central display but for blind operation it's still hard to match basic physical controls yeah 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 absolutely so we're kind of getting to the end of our, our allotted time slot and there's so many topics that we haven't covered we haven't discussed ADAS and autonomous vehicle functions and, and the role that they have to play when it comes to the user experience we haven't covered things like wireless carplay and how that's kind of panning out 5g new audio technologies it feels very much like we need another episode at some point soon. Um, but I think that's the time that we've got right now. Um, we do a lot of testing, as I mentioned before. Um, we, we publish regular reports on new models that we've tested and the team's also involved in a lot of um, bespoke testing projects on behalf of OEMs. Um, and they'd be happy to, to talk through their methodologies and their experiences in more detail with any OEMs or suppliers out there um, that are interested in finding out more. Adam, Mark, I'd like to thank you both again for, for joining today. It's been really interesting, really insightful, um, and I look forward to hopefully catching up again soon. Thanks yeah, very thanks much. Very much Pleasure. And thank thanks you. to our audience for joining in. Look forward to the next one.